Take Welcome away. to another of the Eurocontrol Aviation Hard Talk Live series. Thanks for joining us. This is the series where, for the last few months, we've been talking about the situation in the aviation industry and how it is that we can come back and what it is that we come back to when we build back better. I'm delighted to say that today we are looking at the perspective of the airports and we have Mr Jos Lammers with us. He is two things uh, relevantly to this. He is the CEO of Munich Airport, Europe's sixth largest airport, but also he's the president of the European Airline, uh, Airports Trade Association, the ACI. But before we talk to Jost and, and hear the airport side of the story, as is traditional in the uh, Eurocontrol Aviation Hard Talks, we go to Mr Eamon Brennan, who is the Director General of, the, of Eurocontrol, to give us a quick update on the situation at the moment. So, Eamon, if you'd be so kind. Good afternoon. Welcome to Hard Talk. A particular welcome to Josh Lammers, the President of ACI Europe and the CEO of Munich Airport. I'm sure you're really going to enjoy this today. As we speak, airlines have lost 390 billion this year in US dollars. We're now looking at 16,000 aircraft currently parked and the second-hand values are all deteriorating quite significantly. 73% reduction in seat capacity this year. Just think about that. And we've seen the end of the 747 with KLM and BA phasing it out and also the A380 where four-engined aircraft are simply too expensive to operate. But here in Europe, we're now facing 6 million fewer flights in 2020. That's 1.7 billion fewer passengers and 140 billion in lost revenue to the aviation industry in Europe. If we look at the segments, cargo has done okay, as you would expect with the pandemic, with all the medical flights, increased by 7%. Business jets, 27% reduction, low cost, 76% reduction, and legacy, 69% reduction. We're here today to look at airports. They're the hardest hit by far. We've had an 85% reduction in passengers, and you can see that this is widespread, from Amsterdam to Istanbul to Madrid. Similarly, with airlines, they continue to suffer. And in the past week, we've seen significant reductions in capacity by Ryanair, Lufthansa and SAS. And equally, airlines like EasyJet and British Airways and Iberia have very limited, if in fact any, operations. However, there is good news on the horizon. We've now had three vaccines been announced and we're looking at these being rolled out over the next year. Interesting to see a fellow Irishman, Alan Joyce, the CEO of Qantas, announce that they will require a vaccine before they will allow any international passengers to board a flight. But remember, it will take 15,000 special flights worldwide over the next two years to distribute the vaccine. So the big question today, and I'm sure Josh and Andrew will address this, is can aviation recover? I believe it can. I believe it will be different and by the second half of 2021 we will see a recovery starting to take place. So over to you Josh and Andrew. Thank you very much. Thanks very much Eamon. Uh, thank you as ever even though I'm never quite sure thanks is the correct word given uh, the magnitude of some of those numbers, all of them on the negative side of the scale of course. Jost, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you for joining us. You became the CEO of Munich Airport on the 1st of January. Great time to start. Yeah, indeed. First of all, uh, good afternoon, Andrew, uh, and uh, also special thanks to, I think, Eamon and to Eurocontrol for inviting me for this platform and for the interview today. So uh, happy to be here. And yeah, you're right, Andrew. 1st of January, uh, the world was still shiny and beautiful. Uh, I was a proud CEO, a newcomer at Munich Airport. Things looked promising. Record year behind us in 2019 at Munich and uh, all the bright future ahead of us. So that, that was when I started. You're right, yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't personal to you. Um, so the situation for airports across Europe at the moment, how, as the president of ACI, how would you describe it? Um, yeah, I think uh, this is really a shocking reality we're all in now. Um, I think if you look at it from, if you can look from it at outside, you cannot really feel how it looks from outside. If you're day 
by day working in this industry at, at the airports. But I think it's, as you said, it's it's unprecedented, this crisis. Um, it's something so big. And uh, I think with over 20 years at airports now in Europe, uh, I could have never imagined something like this going on, hitting us, hitting the industry, but especially uh, all us airports uh, across all the lines, regional airports, small ones, big ones, hubs, international, point to point. I mean, it's all, it's all of us. Uh, we're all sitting in the same deep crisis and uh, this is really, really something, something extraordinary. So what does, what does the future look like for airports then? Um, we heard, sorry, let me ask that again. We heard from Eamon there's good news, the possible vaccine. Yeah. There's 15,000 flights needed to get the vaccine distributed. <clears throat> how does, how do the airports pull, pull out from here? I think indeed. I mean, first of all, it's uh, it's good news if really the vaccine is 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 uh, is on its way. I think we're all desperately looking forward uh, to get uh, really um, the positive impacts out of this. And I think, as we all know, that's what's hitting us at the moment: all the travel restrictions, and quarantines across Europe and um, to third markets. So we have all this expectation that with the vaccine, uh, we will see a better future and things starting to open again but um, but i think that's the good news the bad news is for me already we have all factored this into our business plans already i assume we have all mm. forecasted already for recovery next year and i need to say this is still something we have no guarantees for um, we don't know what will really happen when will it really uh, open the markets and reduce travel restrictions so i think um, that that's the bad news somehow uh, we're assuming this already and uh, we don't know what happens after Lockdown number two we are in right now. Um, we cannot exclude a lockdown number three. So, of course, in general, I'm positive, assuming we will get recovery, but uh, still a very long way, a difficult winter ahead of us, horrible winter schedule for us all. Um, and the summer is, again, more than open and uh, no guarantees that things come back. Wow. Wow. So have, do you think airports are increasingly needing to be much more flexible to to react really quickly to these things? I think the, I think so. This is one of the, the takeaways and all of the lessons we we all needed to learn um, immediately when when the coronavirus hit us with the first lockdown in spring. We all immediately needed to hand, handle our capacities differently, our uh, resources. We were all of us closing terminals, infrastructure, satellite buildings, even runways. We were all immediately handling the cost side, our OPEX to reduce cost as much as possible. Uh, we're working with all kinds of concepts in terms of organization and headcount reduction. So, yeah, indeed, I think this was a very hard, but also quick lesson to learn for everyone. And um, yeah, I'm there to say this will be also part of the future, right? This flexibility we gained and uh, to operate on such a basis. It Normally, when one thinks of airports, one doesn't necessarily think of really fast moving and flexible. I mean, one of the great arguments in aviation is that the airlines are very flexible and they can move their assets anywhere. And airports, of course, have huge inflexible assets. That sort of really rapid reaction, was that a culture shock, do you think, to the airports? I think so very much. I think so. Well, I think so exactly what you described. I think on the one end, we are the infrastructure providers. We are operating in terms of master plans. We are thinking ahead for 10, 20 years, decades. That's how we use to develop capacity to build new terminals and runways. So I think that's on the one end. And I think this is also the special challenge these days to, to balance on the one hand, we all still believe, I think, into our long-term development plans. But on the other hand, we need to adjust to the short-term needs and goals. And uh, uh, I think this is something new that is really, um, challenging you every day that you think and no longer in again only months and years and then decades but you need to react within a day within a week um, to capacity needs to requirements from airline partners health authorities the general public so yeah it's uh, business becomes more agile and um, requires much much more flexibility from all of us yeah. How do you see the airlines reacting as, as your customers? Do you think they're in the same boat or are they suddenly becoming more steady in what they do? I think it was also interesting and same experience to some extent on their side. I mean, talking about airlines, of course, as you are aware, we have different uh, 
kind of uh, airline models, um, yeah, network um, operations and network airlines have, of course, a different uh, way to go if you immediately uh, reduce your capacity, if you go down with your operations, for instance, at a hub airport like Munich. This is different than uh, maybe the very agile flexibility model of, of ultra low cost carriers, which is much more used to work and operate um, from one day to the other to stimulate capacity to move aircrafts around. And this is a totally different world than um, like, like network carriers planning and organizing hubs operation in schedules. Yeah, but, but what I think is really interesting to see now also um, network airlines were very much, I think, uh, at the forefront to reduce and to get used to really flying basically without a schedule in a diverted commerce. Yeah, I, I think they really were successfully managing this challenge for them to really test the market, uh, to, to to try something, test and trial, uh, trial and error, and just to just to do something with their capacity to see where could they open markets, stimulate some flights, and three weeks later there's again a travel restriction and. Yeah, you go the other way around. So I think it was uh, an interesting period so far for everyone. Yeah, a lot of interesting things come out of that conversation, I think. We're going to talk about slots, I can assure you of that. Uh, and of course, I love that expression, stimulate the market, by which you mean lower prices. So obviously, we'll talk about airport charges as well. But before I get to that, how do you think the aviation industry is going to look at the end of this crisis and, and five years from now? How do you think it's going to be different? Well, I think, um, again, starting with us airports, I think um, lesson tells me, lesson to learn tells me there's also and always something that will stay. Um, if you look back uh, after 9-11, all the security regimes we have developed, um, safety we have anyhow on the forefront and on top of it. But but I could imagine there's some, some features, maybe elements after this crisis that will also stay and change the way we are operating, for instance, airports uh, in terms of health, health requirements, uh, pandemic. Uh, requirements. So I think um, th there might be elements that will stay and will continue to uh, to be part of our daily life at airports. I think in general, um, yeah, the requirements will increase for airports to really also managing this part successfully of our business to provide solutions, requires a lot of cooperation with airline partners, requires even more, let's say, challenges for us in terms of capacity, right? I mean, the new rules, uh, distances and uh, uh, um, um, to, to keep distance, this, this has an impact on, on the capacity of a terminal. So, so I think in five years from now, um, I hope the immediate challenge is gone. We will see again a lot of passengers traveling. Things are back to some kind of normal, but it will be also kind of new normal. Some things will, uh, will, will stay. That's, that's my expectation here. Do you think the airlines will have changed their shape at all, or do you think we'll go back to having big legacy carriers, long-haul network carriers using hubs, and low-cost carriers using smaller airports, more regional airports? Mm. Well, I think, um, first of all, I believe the general market dynamics, the competition environment of the airline and the aviation business in general in Europe uh, is still intact. That means it will continue to have really a lot of competition, growing competition, less players. I think the consolidation of the market will continue. Mm. I think this crisis, like previous crises, will just uh, enforce certain players uh, to, to, to be uh, survivors and to be the winners of this crisis. On the other part, I think it's also interesting, maybe what you mentioned, the, the traditional carriers or even some national carriers, if you want to use that term. Um, I think they have also now a new, I mean, let's say, uh, new, new, they get a new tailwind there if you see all the state aid. I mean, the billions of euros coming down uh, that will also, to some extent, uh, extend the competition, will uh, give, uh, again, new market access for certain airline partners to stay in the market uh, who without such state aid might have a more difficult time to face. So, so I think in general, we will go and continue the same way. But what I said before, I think um, there will be learnings also for network carriers um, in terms of organization, the traffic, um, also part of the capacity. They've taken a lot of capacity out of the market, um, so they may shrink, they may reduce capacities, strengthening the hub and the, and, 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 the, and the hubbing traffic. But I think there's also some learning in terms of what I call flying without a schedule, being more flexible, mm -hmm. using capacity here or there just to uh, take opportunities uh, for certain periods, for certain 
markets only. So I think that that is something I could imagine they will they they, they will take away from the crisis. Right, Munich, of course, Europe's sixth largest airport has a very very strong relationship with Lufthansa and is Lufthansa's second hub. How, are you confident that Lufthansa will continue its operations at similar sorts of levels after the crisis? I think we will see them very much continue and to grow and to return to the old strength of the Munich Airport hub. Uh, as you know, we are very proud to be the only five-star uh, hub here. We have really a, a, a premium segment here to serve and what I think is, of course, what we will see at the very short term, you know, to rebuild hub is much more complicated than start point to point traffic immediately. So, mm -hmm. so I think it will take more time. It will take the time to establish first the structure of the network again, um, to rebuild it, then you strengthen the network by increasing fre frequencies, increasing the size of the aircraft. So, so I think it's more building back to something. Uh, while again on a point to point traffic with immediately restart uh, you will be much faster but but in the midterm i think we are very optimistic i think we feel the joint spirit with our uh, partnership here with lufthansa uh, you know we even operate our terminal 2 system with them it's a big benefit to really having um, joint interests here and a joint focus on on priorities and and that will help us again to to return very quickly to 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 the level of uh, success we had before as a, as a mm. European in, global. Indeed, thank you for raising that because it is another topic of deep interest to me. The relationship that, that Munich and Lufthansa has is much, how do I say this, nicely friendlier than the relationship between a lot of other airports and, and airlines. And indeed, am I right that there's some profit sharing or something like that in Terminal 2? Is that the, the, the nature of the relationship? Indeed, the logic of this uh, Terminal 2 cooperation and joint venture, it's a joint venture in the sense of 60, 40 percent. Um, 60 so to the airline or 60 to the airport? 60 to the airport. It's our land, it's our facility, it's our area that we develop. But again, it's a, it's a really, I think, the perfect way to cooperate because all, all the revenue streams we are generating in the aviation field, but also in the non-aviation field. So we really bring it all into one, uh, well, I wouldn't call it the single till model, but it is single really, till. if I think about it, even without developing on that one, it is really to that extent uh, helping a lot in the partnership because you really balance always the needs, what is priority, the operational aspect, the commercial aspect, shopping, retail. Uh, so you can really uh, jointly develop this uh, with your individual competences. I think we are very strong on the operations, on the non-aviation side, we are very strong on the technical and master planning. Um, of course, also the coordination. And, and again, Lufthansa are bringing traffic, bringing know-how, bringing the network. I think this is, and it's not only Lufthansa, it's a Starlines hub in that sense, also it's joint uh, exercise. So yeah, this is really unique. And um, I think it especially helps you also in the crisis because it's not only nice and shiny um, if you grow, but I mean also the opposite then helps if you if you are partners in this. Oh, okay. So 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 you've been sharing some of the downside as well as some of the upside. Do you, two questions come from that? The the first one is how do the other airlines that fly to Munich feel about that relationship that you have with the Star Alliance? Uh, I know that Ryanair and Wiz and EasyJet what and what have you fly to to Munich as well. Do, do they feel left out of that? Well, I don't think so, because I think on the other hand, we also, we are, I think, really covering all the needs for all our airline partners. Uh, though Lufthansa is a very strong uh, for our Terminal 2 system. We have another terminal, luckily, that was the first terminal at Munich Airport um, before this cooperation with Lufthansa took place, and that is Terminal 1. And that provides really a lot of uh, nice facilities. We're just now investing over 450 million euros again. Um, to refurbish and implement uh, new new systems there. So this is exactly the product we can offer for all other airline partners. And it's also a very nice one. We're using uh, the, the, the airside uh, capacities together. No, I think don't feel there's also a nice way of um, handling the situation. I think that, that works perfectly at this stage and uh, provides for everyone whatever you want and uh, fly into Munich. Uh, I think what you mentioned is rather the difficulties, of course, in terms of slots and constraints. We have more from the capacities in general, 
Um, that's why we have um, uh, the, the structures of, of our traffic as we have it today. So let's turn to slots, if I may. Thank you for raising the matter of slots. Uh, the ACI, as a general comment, ACI Europe, as opposed to ACI World, ACI Europe, as a general comment, is is resisting any sort of slot freeze and slot, you know, slot waiver and what have you. Is that going to be the situation in Munich as well? Well, I think, uh, of course, we are also part of ACI, and I think we're also having our German um, associations on this one. And of course, you are perfectly right. Um, slots is a very much a very deeply disputed item also among airports because of course everyone has different needs requirements airline partners and so i think this is really a specific topic what's not always easy to align i think what what for us in munich but i think also for aci europe is our position there is i think we want to be partners in this because i mean slots at the end of the day is our capacity at the airport so i think the basic concern was always for us airports that we have no say in this, right? I mean, it's mm. it's not us um, being involved into the distribution of slots. So I think that's also what you raised now in this situation where we really, of course, we want to to help the industry. We all want to provide the opportunity to to return with our traffic, but of course, we also want to be partner in this. And partner means also you are asked. You can jointly agree on the terms and conditions, how to handle slots, what are the conditions for a waiver how to make sure that you can provide as an airport always a level playing field, right? We want to, of course, to some extent, depending always on the airport, stimulate uh, growth, stimulate also competition, want to have really a, a, rich, a rich variety of airline partners. So so I think that is more, more the gist that's important for us that we want to be asked, we want to be involved. Uh, and I think in this, in this regard, we also could find solutions for the waiver for the running world. Winter schedule season, as you see, and uh, I think we are all very, very much um, cooperating in this at the moment. How the, encouraging innovation and, and and new new carriers and 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 different carriers to come to your airport is obviously a good thing, unless you're Lufthansa, isn't it? In Munich, surely they're not so keen on having competitors come into the airport. Of course, I mean. Uh, I think it's not only for us here, but I think you have always traditional carriers, you have strong partners, everyone has a traffic profile and an airline partnership structure that has been grown over the years. And I think it also depends always on the markets you want to serve and the opportunities to have. And as you know, we are very much in the last 10, 15 years, we Munich was successful on building really from scratch uh, a hub, an hub airport that really provides great services and I think we believe and then also uh, rich connections for more than 260 destinations directly from Munich. And I think that is very important for us, for the region, mm -hmm. uh, for the economy to really provide su such a network. And as you know, still it's the best way how to handle this magnitude of, con con uh, uh, of, of destinations is still the best way always to have a transfer hub, to have uh, hub and spoke operation to really rotate passengers around and, and to fill the aircraft. And I think that's very much uh, our business model that was successful. And that's, of course, we're very much looking to develop this again also after this crisis. But but again, this does not exclude. We have some low cost partners here, um, airport partners. And this is more maybe in general than, of course, also, you know, it's always about slot availability, but, but also about pricing. We have regulated mm -hmm. charges in Germany and Europe. So so I think it's also part of the truth. It's, um, yeah. it's coming from that side as well. Well, I, I, we, we need to move on. We've got lots to talk about, but I'm really interested. First, I think, do you see low-cost carriers pushing into hubs or do you think they're going to stick to some of the lower, the smaller, more regional airports? That's my first question. And secondly, as you rightly said, charges in Europe are very heavily regulated which must surely make it more difficult to attract new airlines. Wouldn't you like to see a situation where you had a lot more freedom in your charging? Yeah, so to your first question, I think um, in, in, I think this this development has started already before Corona, that it's no longer true that low-cost carriers or ultra-low-cost fly only for the regional airports. You know, uh, they were very, let's say, opportunistic. They are using opportunities to enter new markets. If you look around now at uh, European airports, I think all major... Uh, airports, the bigger hubs, uh, the secondary hubs, we all have now learned the business of how to handle uh, low-cost operations. And I think we also need to 
uh, confirm they are bringing growth, they are bringing opportunities. So I think uh, this is again the way forward. Um, they, they are part of of the main mainstream and part of the big airports. And to your second point, uh, indeed, I mean we have on the one hand regulated charges, but I think what was quite interesting to see during this crisis, I think um, more than 90 percent, 98 percent, percent I was reading of all our airports in Europe. We're all offering incentive schemes, right? Mm -hmm. We all need to offer something. We need to uh, to rebuild our traffic even more after this crisis. So I think uh, there are schemes, uh, incentive schemes in place. We can handle them. Uh, I think we can offer opportunities here. Uh, but what I think is always important to make sure this must be transparent and discriminatory. It must be objective. So the criteria, and I think that's maybe sometimes what certain airline partners do not like. Uh, we treat them all the same. We must treat them the same way. Um, but again, I think the tools are there. And uh, yeah, maybe to connect to this, I think that's what I also see. Of course, the pressure is getting bigger and bigger now on us airports. Mm. Since years, we are saying uh, also uh, in Brussels, there was so much airport competition now, really airport competition, less airlines, consolidations, there's so much purchasing power and uh, so many small airports, medium-sized, big airports. So we are competing for the same cake, and I believe this will come back after this crisis. Uh, right. do, you, do, you see, do you see the airports responding by consolidating? Is there any sort of chance for the airports to become big in the way the airlines did? I think there are some nice examples already. I mean, especially in Europe, I think we have some really successful uh, bigger airport groups already. I mean... You know them from Aena, from Aeroport de Paris. We have mm. Ford, Zurich. We have also in the UK um, partners there. So I think um, there, there's also on that, that front already some some airports. But I think it's also true still that our business is much more driven. We are connected to the ground. We are operating an airport. Um, we cannot move it around. Uh, of course, maybe we have several airports in one network. Um, but again. Uh, Airlines are much more agile to move around. Mm. The airlines are much more agile to move around the aircrafts and the capacity. While we always can provide capacity only in a destination uh, where we're living and where we're operating an airport. Yeah. So, what about the other great relationship at an airport that often gets overlooked? That with the ANSP. Would you like to take over control of your tower at Munich? I don't think so. I'm happy to have some as partners here. I mean, no, I think this is also, I agree, it's an important leg also of our of our operation always. I think uh, I think what is important for us and to see everywhere uh, the improvements in the years already to have really service provider mentality, I think that is important. We, at the end of the day, all working for the same uh, customer, for the passenger. We are operating an airport or an airline or we operating and managing the airspace. Um, so I think this really ecosystem, I would call it, this ecosystem of aviation to provide at the end a great product, a flexible product, a product that also has economies of scale and reducing costs. Uh, the cost basis is important for everyone. Uh, I think in that sense, uh, I think it's good to have good partners with our NS NSPs everywhere. Uh, but of course, to also have joint um, yeah, relations, commitments, maybe KPIs, that would, of course, always be appreciated. And I think that's a way forward to to really get commitments from everybody. Uh, how can we, again, improve the journey from A to Z for a passenger? Is, is, is your ANSP, DFS, interested in that sort of a total journey KPI approach, do you think? I Go think, on, name uh, names. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, I think it's a uh, no, it's not secret. I think we are, I think what I realize is from also my previous airports experience always, you have, of course, usually a very good and close relation with your, with your local team from, uh, from the tower. You're really coordinating, you're running this airport or your airport's always together. You're managing, you're planning ahead, the resource allocation. I think all this goes hand in hand. But I could imagine that also, if you look at the the German or the European level, I think that would be more my my point to look at how we can really uh, see to improve their uh, standards, standardization, um, uh, less complexity, also committed uh, com commitments, firm commitments on on how to allocate resources. So I think that would help also to improve, as we all know, still our, our joint project, single European mm -hmm. sky, still. A, important one to move ahead with so yeah i think 
topics do not change. Um, and I think that's something uh, also after this crisis should not go away. We need to push for more. Right. So topics not changing. Here's another one, but maybe the speed is moving because of COVID. What about the technology at an airport? What technologies do you think we're going to use going forward? I think everyone gets a lot of push these days also to improve, for instance, on digitalization, um, to increase really uh, the usage everywhere. We were very happy just last week at Munich now, we have uh, the digital access with biometrics to our um, uh, to our security areas, but also to the boarding area. We have there jointly with Lufthansa and Starlines now this biometrics. This took us a long period of time, you know, uh, data protection and things. But in the crisis, things suddenly may move faster. So we got all the approvals from authorities and now it's just implemented. And I think that's what we all will see and need to push for to have more touchless um, um, elements in our journey. Yeah, still at the end of the day, uh, less, less operation, physical operation in the terminals. But again, digitalization can provide a lot of solutions. Um, we have them at hand. We just need to invent them, uh, in, in invest and uh, implement them now. And uh, I think that 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 is for me one of the biggest learnings to really push for digitalization as much as you can. So how do you see that? I'm 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 laughing at the irony of having digitalization at hand, of course. But leave that aside for a moment. Uh, how do you see the passenger journey then? I'm going to pre-check in online. I'm going to get to the airport. They're going to read my eye. Is is that what it is or yeah, that's what now we. That's the technology with biometrics. It's your uh, iris, and then then you're getting the the gate opening for entering security areas. I think still on security, that will be the hardest one to find their solutions. Um, besides, of course, uh, the scanner technologies we already have. I think there's another new feature, and that connects nicely to your earlier question: what will stay after this crisis? We have now a new product. Also, I mean, also jointly with Lufthansa, pushing this for so-called tested flights. So it means. Everyone on board of an aircraft, all passengers and crew, had before departure uh, um, um, a negative Corona and, 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 and COVID-19 test. So I think this could be another element, right? To check this also there with, with your boarding card, with a scanner. Then you enter the areas uh, on the air side and also there boarding, lounge access, all with eye scan. Iris, this is uh, what we're doing now. We see again. I started. We started last week with two. Um, touch points, but lounges access and also one more feature we want to start soon to, to also develop. So it's now to scale it up, to roll it out. But but I think um, that that would be one of uh, would be a nice benefit to really get these things now done to get a much more automated terminal operation. Right. So again, in terms of my journey, I I literally look at a screen. I get into the security area. I go through security, which we hope becomes more and more efficient and contactless, I then go and, and that would probably include my health certificate or yep, at some point. Yeah. yeah. Or your, and, your mobile. Yeah. And then I go down to the lounge um, and I look at the door and the door opens for me and then someone inside knows who I am and and, yep. and and so forth. And then I get to the gate and I board again by looking at a screen. Is that exactly. what, what you're That's saying? Exactly. Going on? That's already working here now. We have two gates just now testing this exactly. Right. As you're saying, so you don't need your mobile any longer. It's just also a little screen. You look into it. You need to be pre-registered for this one, but if of you course. the yeah. one-time pre registration on the on the on the on the star line, sorry to talk about always star lines, but then you download the app and then you're in there. So and that works then at each and every airport where this technology is in place. So I think uh, we should get a lot of push from this. Right. And and do you think that's well, let me rephrase. What's the most urgent technology we need just to get over the crisis, do you think? Is it, is it this one? I believe for the terminal operation, it's a big one, but still, I believe, I mean, this is a visible part for the passenger. I still believe what is also a very important um, exercise to continue with and to improve continues is all our airports operation in terms of um, uh, the, the, the critical systems. It's about the airport operational database. Uh, it's also about what we're talking about a lot, you know, these days with Euro control, we need total airport management, we need network management. So it's really still to bring together uh, the, the resources and the, the, the data from everyone at this airport. It's still, I believe, I mean, we're talking about this also for years now, but 
I think if you look at our daily operation, we still have so many fragmented system, mm. fragmented resource allocation and planning. So really to also uh, bring this together to have really joint control rooms, I think there's still a long way to go. And I think this is a not visible part for passengers, but maybe even more important just to optimize the airport operation to be more efficient. You can react with all resources immediately if it comes to delays uh, or any, any other operational hiccups. And you know, these are hundreds of hundreds of hiccups and changes every day. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, you always work in a lot of systems and subsystems. So I think that's even the, the bigger exercise uh, behind behind the wall. Yeah. So just finally, on to, as we get towards the end, you've just talked about all the invisible issues. Of course, airports are very, very visible if you're a local resident, aren't they? Visible and audible, of course, they can be heard. How, what's your relationship with your local community? And, and do you think that's a fundamental part of having a licence to grow? I believe so. I think it's, especially for us in Western Europe, one of the key elements to, of course, we're all depending um, on, on the cooperation with our neighbourhoods. We need to manage them somehow. We all know the truth is there's always an impact uh, from aviation from an airport. Uh, it's not only only positive all the time. I mean, we're paying a lot of taxes, creating jobs, delivering growth, uh, providing supplies. Uh, but, of course, we all know about the critical issues of, of, of noise, of uh, carbon footprints these days. So I think uh, the task uh, remains the same. Uh, again, it's no longer only the noise issues we see, but very much also handling um, even more in the future to be net carbon zero. You know, we have our roadmaps on ACI level now, we roll it out. I think we need to be very active on this side. I think we need to, uh, to show the way forward uh, to develop our own concept and implement them uh, because we will depend on the acceptance of people and passengers traveling, not only the local neighborhoods, but also um, our passengers want us mm. to become greener. They want us to be uh, carbon neutral. So so I think, yeah, this is very important, but also some maybe interesting uh, from the crisis. I think for the very first time, you know, we have also some uh, strong opposition from neighboring communities here. Um, but now uh, in this crisis, when we needed to stop all our tax payments, um, yeah, reducing uh, also uh, employment levels everywhere around the airport, subcontractors, ground hand, I think uh, suddenly for the first time people yeah, realize again, what does it mean if your airport is not performing and is not growing, but rather shrinking. So I think, uh, yeah, this, this very ambiguous uh, relationship is also uh, uh, part, of, part of this crisis. People understand again, what are the benefits yeah, and yeah. why is it important yeah. to, to, well, to, to see I, the advantages of airports. That, that, that must be a constant juggle for you, though, to keep the local residents happy, but understand the understand the issues. You, do you think Europe will ever build another runway? Well, I think at the moment, our short term, you know, I think, of course, we, we are managing, as I said before, airport capacities for decades to come. And I think um, even now with this crisis, I think we still believe, as you know, we are forecasting in certain years, early as 2024, we expect to be back on all the record levels from 2019. So, so I think it's always important to keep uh, the perspectives and the opportunities open. I think... Uh, uh, for the years to come, for us as the infrastructure at uh, Munich Airport, it's most important to get much better access to our intermodality in terms of railway connection. We need uh, more frequent, more direct connections from downtown Munich. We are uh, already lobbying strongly for connecting into the regions, but also for having an, an interregional um, connection of, of any rail link traffic. So. So I think this is much more uh, on the on the agenda for the next years. But also in terms of additional terminal capacity, and ultimately also I think runway. This is nothing I think we should say no, um, because I think there's still a long and successful future for airports to come. I'm I'm delighted to hear that, and that leads perfectly to my final question, which is the question I always ask at the end, which is, what do you think Eurocontrol Euro can do to help facilitate all of this? What more are you looking uh, to Eurocontrol for? Well, I think, first of all, I think they're already doing right now in the crisis really a terrific job. I think really what the advocacy of, of uh, Eurocontrol is, is really tremendous. I think they have already proven all the value they, they're adding to, to the whole industry in this crisis. I, appreciate always these very 
unfortunately still negative, but really up to date news. We always get from Eamon there. Um, I really appreciate it because it's important to be transparent. It's important to get these information um, to see what, what's going on. What I already mentioned, I think um, what I believe is particularly important is the Euro control, Euro control network manager, this, this concept. Um, I think there's something we should have also very much on our plans for the time when the recovery is done. Um, and I think this is really huge, hugely important. And, and again, I simply can say with all the knowledge uh, and also the leadership they're taking during the crisis, uh, this, this is so important. So, so no, I can only, not only because they are running the hard talk with, for both of us, Andrew, today, but uh, I think this is also another example um, of providing a great platform for industry exchange. No, great job well, by your control. Well, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I hope you found that as interesting and as informative as I did. Jos, thank you for your time. Thank you for your, your background, your wisdom, which I found really, really helpful. Ladies and gentlemen, our, our next hard talk, uh, indeed our last hard talk for this year, is on the 7th of December, and it includes Mr. Michael O'Leary, uh, a man who has one or two opinions, and so it'll be quite interesting to see uh, if we can draw them out of him. But I'm also delighted to tell you that we are looking at doing hard talks into next year as well. But in any event, I will look forward to seeing you on the 7th and I wish you a very good day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you.